just have to work our way through it. But I told you last week, Malachi uh, is the last book of the Old Testament. It, it ends a dispensation and opens up or prepares for a new dispensation, the, uh, the dispensation of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the law, uh, is giving way until the new covenant, the uh, New Testament uh, covenant of grace and mercy that we find through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so it's at the end of a dispensation, at the closing of an age. But I want you to think about this because it, it comes into play in our study of the book of Malachi. We too live at the end of a dispensation. Or I believe that. Maybe, maybe not. I, I, I wouldn't dare try to tell you when the Lord's coming back. I just simply believe by the word of God and by the signs of the times, I just believe that we're, we're drawing near to the coming of the Lord. It could be at any moment, at any time. And so this dispensation, the dispensation, the age of, the, uh, of grace of the Gentiles will give way ultimately to the millennial dispensation uh, when the Lord comes back and sets up a kingdom on earth for a thousand years. And so we too, I believe, are living at the end of a dispensation and so uh, in writing to these people, uh, he's giving them a word, and uh, I believe the word applies to us. I told you last week, my desire in this study is not to teach it so much from a historical perspective. I want to teach it from a practical perspective. I, wanted, I want to apply these messages to your life as, as, as best I can, and Malachi's a wonderful book to do that. So last week, we looked at the first five verses. Tonight... I want to begin in verse number six. Let me just read this opening verse. It said, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Listen to this. If then I am the father, who's speaking? God is speaking. If, I, if then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to the priest who despise my name, Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? I want you to note the sarcasm there. I want you to note how flippantly the Lord is, the Lord is addressing these people and bringing an accusation against them. And just notice how flippant, how, how uh, sarcastic they are in their response. Oh, yeah? How did we despise your name? Well, uh, if you will, slip down to verse 13 because this is kind of the, uh, the key verse for my text. Uh, he goes on to say, You also say, Oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord. There are those who are saying, Oh, oh, how tedious. Oh, how tiresome is this thing called worship. Oh, how weary we are of coming into the house of the Lord and singing all of these songs and bringing all of our sacrifices and going through all of this thing. We're weary of it. We're tired of it, Lord. That's basically what God is accusing them of. And then verse 13 says, and you sneer at it. What does that mean? You turn your nose up at it. You come to God's house and you hold your nose up like you're too good to be in my presence. You sneer at my service. And maybe this was not so much outwardly as it was inwardly, but if you haven't already learned this, learn this quickly. God's not so concerned about the outward appearance as he is about the heart. God looks past what you do as to why you do it. He looks into the heart, and he knows the heart, and he knew the heart of these people. Surely they were still coming to church. They were still attending worship. They were still bringing their sacrifices, but their heart wasn't in it. They sneered at it, and, 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 and they mocked God. And I suppose that maybe the greatest malady, listen carefully, the greatest malady of the church age in which we live in is not a lack of worship because, can I tell you, worship broke out in a new way in, in the 80s, and, and, and it has not stopped. There has been an increased activity. Listen, there's been an, act, an increased activity of worship in the church of God, but I'm scared there's a lack of true worship in the house of God. There's a lot of outward show. There's a lot of new songs and a lot of waving hands and, and a lot of people doing a lot of things. But, but I, I, I feel like maybe in a lot of senses there's a lack of, of real worship in God's house. So many people trudge to church Sunday after Sunday thinking they're doing God some tremendous favor by showing up and being there. Amen. 
They, they, they come and they appear, and when they leave, they say, "Woo, I got my I got my uh, my duty done for this week. I I went to church on Sunday, and and I'm free for the rest of the week." And and. They come in and they sit around and they 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 uh, look at what's going on, look at the people, have a cup of coffee, enjoy a little bit of, uh, of talking with other people. But by the time the service gets started, the singing becomes tiresome and and the service becomes long. And before the preacher's done and the altar calls given, listen, listen. Shamey, shamey, shamey on you. I know there's times you have to slip out before the service is over. You might have a, 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 an event with family, but if you just slip out to get out, amen, you're, you're missing the best part of the service. That's what it's all about is, is watching God change people's lives. Is that too tough? I'm sorry if it is. I said it anyway, amen. I'm, I know I'm preaching, to the, I'm preaching to the choir tonight. You're not the ones that need to hear this message, because, but that's where we're at, amen. So, so you can go and share it. Y'all are people that love God. You're people that are here tonight. Uh, you came because you worked all day, and you were still tired in body, but you were hungry for the, for the Word of God. But, but there's a lot of the church that's not like that. They come to, to, to fulfill a duty, and the problem is, is the thrill is gone. The excitement is gone. The, the desire to worship God, the desire to come into his presence has passed. The zeal is gone. The joy of the serving of the Lord has passed. And church has just become something that, that, that it's a religious duty that they just feel like they have to fulfill. Can I get a witness? Amen. Now, if that's the way you are, you're probably not because you're here tonight. But, but if that's the way you are, you're in a very dangerous predicament. You, you, th this word is for you, and you need to hear it. And, and maybe you know others that maybe you could share it with, or at least point them to this uh, to this live stream later on. Tell them to watch it. But 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 it's a very dangerous place to be when you get tired of worship. My my message tonight is weary of worship. Because that's what Malachi is talking to a people about. They're at the end of a dispensation and they become weary of the sacrifices and weary of the service of, of God. And he's writing to them because he wants to put life back in to worship. He wants to put the zeal and the enjoyment of the Lord back into the house of God. Now listen to me. An unexcited Christian, most important thing I'll say tonight, you might want to write it down. An unexcited Christian is simply a Christian who's forgotten who God is. If you're unexcited about church, if you're un are you following me now? Very, very, very important. If you're unexcited about the house of God and the things of God and the worship of God, I'll tell you the problem. You've forgotten who God is. That's what Malachi is going to remind us of here tonight in this text. He's going to remind us exactly of who God is because when you understand who God is, how can you not be excited about it? When you get a full, full view of the, uh, of the reality of who it is that washed us in his own blood and saved us out of darkness and brought us into this marvelous light, the one that has given us joy and peace and love and, and filled our lives with all good things, if you can't get excited about that, then you're probably not born again to start with. But a lot of people have gotten their eyes off the Lord. They've forgotten who God is, and they, they've gotten their eyes on religion or their eyes on the things of the world, and they've lost their joy. They've, they've become weary of worship. In fact, the word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words, in theos, which means in God. If you're going to be enthused, you ought to be enthused in God or God in you. You could say that either way. Now, you cannot truly believe the things that we're supposed to believe and be lukewarm about it. You can't. You can't, uh, you can't truly understand God and be lukewarm about it. I, I'm not talking, listen, I'm not talking about being tired in the work. I get tired in the work. I get tired in serving the Lord because the work of the Lord is work a lot of times. Amen. It is work. It is. It, 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 it's laborious, and 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 there are times when when I get bone tired. But I'll tell you today, in in the in in the witness of this congregation and standing before God, I get tired in the work, but I've never gotten tired of the work. 
I don't understand. I, 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 I've been preaching now for almost 30 years, been pastoring almost for 30 years, and, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the but I do not, uh, I read these articles, I hear these, I go to these conferences, and I hear all this about pastor burnout. I'm here to tell you I've never in 30 years, I don't understand what pastoral or ministerial burnout is. I've never been burned out in the Lord. I'm just as enthused in serving God today as I was the very first day that God called me to serve him. I don't understand how you burn out unless you lose focus of who you're serving. I don't, I don't, listen, uh, pastors talk to me sometimes. When are you going to retire? I'm going to retire at 65. When are you going to retire? I don't, I'm not concerned about retiring. You know what, you know what brings fear and dread into my heart is the day I might have to retire. The day I might have to. I, I won't put you through when my mind goes and my body goes and I, I just can't do it anymore. I won't put you through it, but I dread that day. My desire would be to drop dead preaching, amen, when I'm 112 years old. That would, that would be what I want because, because I, I, I'm thrilled about my service to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's done everything for me. But these people, these people, they were weary of worship. And they, they grew weary because they, they didn't understand who God was. And so Malachi comes along and he says, well, let me tell you. Let me, let me bring you back to your remembrance who you're serving. Because when you understand who you're serving, praise God, you're going to, listen, if you're weary of worship, just listen to what I'm about to say, amen. Because if you can refocus your attention on God, I promise you, you'll leave different than when you came. Number one, he says, recognize the nature of God. Say nature. The nature of God. Look again in verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reference? God says, my nature is father and master. If you want to know who I am, I'm a father and I'm a master. Now let's look at those separately. Look at God as a father. He, he, he is our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. God is our father. If God is our father, then who are you? If you're a man, you're a... If you're a woman, you're a daughter. We are sons and daughters. God is our father. Hallelujah. We are the sons and the daughters of a father. And if we're a son of a daughter, what do you owe a father? What does the Bible say you owe a father? Honor thy father and thy mother. And I promise you, anybody I've ever known that had a good father, some of you maybe didn't have a good father. Some of you may not even know who your father is. But if you had a good father, a father who loved you, a father who protected you, a father who supplied for you, I'll tell you what you do every time you're around them, you honor them. You speak respectfully of them. Why? Because they're your father. Well, listen, uh, as good as your daddy was here on earth, you have a heavenly father that far surpasses any, any earthly father you could ever possibly have. He's my daddy. He takes good care of me. He loves me. He provides for me. He is my father. The word honor is a Hebrew word which actually means to attach weight to something or to take something with seriousness. Now listen to me. If you don't take God seriously, worship is going to be a bother to you. When you come in here, if you don't know who you're worshiping, if you don't understand who he is, if you don't understand that aspect of your father, you won't bring him honor. Does that make sense? Because you've not added any weight to him. He's a, he, he, is, he is not worthy of your honor. When you understand that God is your father, when you understand that you've been born into a new family, you've been adopted. He didn't have to take you, but he adopted. He wanted you, amen. And he adopted you and brought you in to his own household. Then you're going to come before him with honor. Listen. If you don't take God seriously, listen very carefully to me. If you don't take God seriously, God would rather you stay home than come in here on Sunday morning. If you don't take him seriously, if you, if you don't honor him when you come into this house, stay home. You say, Pastor, I, I don't believe you ought to tell anybody to stay home. Well, I didn't. God did. 
You say, I don't believe that. Well, let me read it to you. It's found in the book of Revelation. He's writing to a church full of believers. God says in Revelation 3.15, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you. I will spew you. I will vomit you out of my mouth. God said, I'd rather you be cold in heart than to come in and act like you love me and don't love me. Be lukewarm about me. I don't want Cindy to be lukewarm about our relationship, amen. I, I, I want her to love me with all that she has. She wants me to love her with all. God wants all that we have. He wants the best that we have. How dare us come in with, with a lukewarm uh, 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 love. G. Campbell Morgan, you've probably read some of his books. He wrote this about half-hearted worship. He said, lukewarmness is the worst form of blasphemy. It's worse than not believing. Listen, it's worse than not believing in God at all than to say, I believe in you, but you just don't excite me. <laughs> I know you and, and, and I believe in you, but you just, don't, you just don't thrill me. You just don't excite me. God says, I, God says it's detestable. He wants, a, he wants a wholehearted worship. So God is a father, and because he's a father, we owe him honor, but he's also a master. If, God, if, if God's a father, we're his sons and daughters. If God is a master, then we are his servants. He's not only a father, he's a master. If I'm a master, then you owe me fear. A father, you owe me honor, but as a master, you owe me fear. Now, what kind of fear? Does, it, does that mean that, that when we come into his presence, we're supposed to quake in our boots? No, that's not what he's talking about. That, that, that's not the kind of fear that, that the Lord wants. Uh, a, a bond slave, listen, I'm a servant. I'm a bond slave. I was bought off the slave market. Do you understand that? I was a slave to what? Satan. And Satan had me on the slave block of sin. And he was trading me. And he was using me in this world. But God came in and he said, I want Raymond Hardy. I want him. I'm willing to pay whatever the price is to redeem him. He bought me. I'm a bond servant and I'm glad to be one. Hallelujah. I'm glad to be a servant of the Most High God. We're not our own, therefore. We're bought with a price. Therefore, what? Glorify God with our body and with our spirit that are God's. So the two things that are necessary when you come into the place of worship, number one, uh, God, you're my father, and number two, God, I fear you because you're my master. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is what is the beginning of wisdom. Let, let, I gotta, I, let me kind of break that out a little bit because, again, we get confused about what fear is. There's two kinds of fears, and, and there's a scripture that, that lays out the, uh, in one verse the, the two different kinds of fear. Moses said in, in Exodus 20, 20, Moses said to the people, fear not. Now, Malachi said that we ought to fear God, and here's Moses saying, fear not. Listen to the rest of the verse. Moses said to the people, fear not, for God is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces. There's, there's two kinds of fear. There's an outward fear of circumstances, of things, of people, but there's an inward fear. Uh, another word you could use that, where is my reverence, is a reverence. An inward fear is an inward reverence of God. You come in and, 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 and you, would, you would be fearful to do certain things if you were to come in before the president of the United States, wouldn't you? You'd walk in a certain trepidation. There'd be a certain fear that you would come in his... How much more so the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? The King of Glory, there, there, there's a fear. If God be for us, listen, who can be against us? The one thing I've learned about the fear of God, if you will fear God a right way, you'll never have to fear anything else in your life. Isn't that powerful? You don't have to fear man. You don't have to fear circumstances. You don't have to fear death. You, there's nothing else in life to fear if you, put, if you have a right fear of God and a right reverence of God and a right glory of God. Then you ne you, There's never any fear in any other area of life. 
And so what is the nature of God? God is a, as a father, we're his sons. God is a master, and we're his servants. And we should never come into the house of God. We should never enter into a worship service without honoring God and without fearing God. And if those are lacking in your life, if you, will, if you will get those in a right place in your life, I promise you, your worship will come alive. Uh, it'll, it'll be the first step in bringing worship to life again. The zeal of the Lord will begin to encompass you, and you'll, you'll enjoy being in his presence. Well, I got I to continue because I got two more points. The, the, the second thing is that that was recognize the nature of God. The second thing is reverence the name of God. Reverence the name of God. Verse 6, he goes on to say, You priests who despise my name, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? Uh, worship has become wearisome to him, and, 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 and God says, You despise my name, and they say uh, flippantly again, In what way have we despised your name? Now remember, he's talking to the priest. The priests are the ones who organize worship in the house of God. The, in the Old Testament times, they were, the, they were the leaders of worship in God's house. But can I tell you, in the New Testament, we don't have priests. The pastor is not the leader because what we've all been made kings and priests in the kingdom of God. Everybody's a priest. We all come into the house. We've all been called into the holy priesthood. We're a royal people, a holy priesthood. And, and so... so we're, we're all been made priest. Now, how then do they despise the name? Well, God's name can be despised, first of all, by our sacrifices. Say sacrifices. They, they despised him with their sacrifices. Look at verse 7. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you by saying the table of the Lord is contemptible? Now, let, let me tell you what they're saying. The, the table of the Lord that they're talking about was where they had to come and bring the offering before they could uh, 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 put it upon the brazen altar to be offered unto the Lord as a sacrifice. There was a table before the altar that they brought the sacrifice whereby it could be divided, it could be portioned, it could be properly prepared to be offered unto God. There was a table that they brought their, their offerings unto the Lord. And and uh, uh, upon that table, they would, they would divide it, and, and, and yet they say that, that the table of the Lord is contemptible. How, how did that work out in their lives? Look at verse 8. And when you offer a blind, when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? And then in verse 13, you also say, oh, what weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. You bring, uh, thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. God says, you have the audacity to come into my worship and to enter into my presence. You bring, you bring flea-bitten, uh, blind, lame, uh, uh, dead animals, and you think I'm going to receive it. You think I'm going to be, uh, it's going to be acceptable unto me. And God says, I'm not having it. You don't bring that. Why? What kind of offering were they to bring? An offering that was without spot or Blemish. Why were they to bring an offering without spot or blemish? Because the offering was a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb, who is without spot and without blemish. And for them to bring a blind, a flea-bitten goat, a, a, an animal that's been killed out in the field, torn by animals, and to offer it unto God, what, a, what, a, what, a, what does that say to the Lord? We have no respect for you. We have no honor for you. We, we, we care nothing about your worship. Your worship means nothing to us. Because we, we despise the very thing that, that, it, uh, that it displays, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in, in, in Exodus 22, there were, uh, it, it was talking about the offerings, and it says this, And you shall be holy men unto me, neither shall you eat any flesh that is torn of beast in the field. You shall cast it to the dogs. 
In other words, if you go out into the field and a, and a wolf has attacked one of your cattle and, and taken it down and killed it, and then you, you, you he said, not only you, would you not bring it to me, you shouldn't even eat it yourself. It's dog food. Do you know what God's saying? Do you know what God's saying? You come into my house and you offer me dog food? And you think I'm going to accept it? You think I'm going to be pleased with it? Where was their heart? Where, 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 where were they? Where were, what were they even thinking? He said, listen, try on your governor. You want me to accept it? Try, take, take your stinking offering to your government, governor and see if he'll accept it. Try this, April 15th next year. When it's time to write that $10,000 check and send it to your uncle in Washington, his name is Sam. Instead of writing that $10,000 offering, I want you to write a little note and say, say, Uncle, uh, thank you. You're, you're, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for providing security for us. And thank you for, for all the, the different pro programs and things that you've provided. But I've had a string of bad luck. The kids have been sick, and I got laid off a few days on my job. And, and I, just don't, I, just don't have, uh, I just don't have the $10,000 here. Here's a check for $5. Thank you so much. Now you tell me, is he going to accept it? No. Listen to me. And yet people come into the house of God and the pastor stands up and says, it's time now to bring our gifts unto the Lord, to bring our tithes, the first fruit of all that God has blessed us with. Bring all your tithes and offerings into the storehouse. Bring it. The offering plate's coming. Bring the first tenth of all that God's brought into you and put it in the offering plate. And we'll sit back and say, well, the kids were sick and I, I didn't work a few days and, and, and Lord, you know, I got my vacations coming up here in a month from now and, and I got my new car note in and, and Lord, I, uh, we got the birthday party for the kids. It's coming up. I got to get the cake. And, the, and Lord, here, I'm going to eat the cake and I'll give you a few crumbs. <laughs> Same thing. You owe everything to God. You don't owe the tithe. You owe everything to God. A whole hundred percent of it belongs to the Lord because God gave it unto you. There are no excuses. There are no excuses for not bringing the tithe into the storehouse. It doesn't matter the circumstances because, listen, if you're that bad off, you need God more than you've ever needed him before. Amen. Bring God the, first, bring God the cake and you take the crumbs and honor God because, listen, if it doesn't cost you anything, God doesn't want it. I remember one time David, uh, David, uh, there was a plague going throughout the land of Israel and David went to the, uh, the house of Aruna into the threshing floor there uh, and he, he knew the only way to please God was to offer God a sacrifice that, uh, and to worship the Lord. And he went into Aruna's threshing floor and he came and, and, he, and Aruna said, listen, I, I've got these cattle, I've got these ox, I've got, listen, I've got wood, all of these plowshares, you can use that for it. Take all that I have and use it and give it unto God if it'll stop this plague. And David said, I'll do, I won't do it. You can give it to me as a king would to a king, but I won't take it. Why? Because if it doesn't cost me anything, it's not going to be pleasing unto God. Bring God the first fruits. Are, are you listening to me? You say, well, I just can't do it. You can't afford not to do it. Will a man rob God? Give and it shall be given you. Press down, shaken together and running over. That's the principle of the kingdom of God. Tell God I love you, God. If, I have to, if they kick me out of my house and I have to go live in a cardboard box, God, I'm going to bring you the first fruit of everything that you bring into my life, God. I'm going to give to you first. And people that don't bring, bring offerings unto the Lord don't really have a true worship of God. I got to go on. Y'all don't like my preaching, but I'm just, I'm just telling you something that'll help you. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. It, it, it is so critical. Let me give you another illustration. Uh, how, about the, how about the man at work? We get up on Sunday morning, we get up on Sunday morning and we look, we open up the shades and it's raining outside. We turn on the news and it's below freezing this morning or it's, or, or it's going to be 95 degrees today and we shut the blinds and say, I think I'll just stay at home. You get up Monday morning and you open up the blinds 
And it don't matter if it's raining, don't matter if it's cold, don't matter if it's hot, don't matter if a hurricane's coming. If you're supposed to be at work, amen, you're going to show up. Why? You honor, the, you honor the boss more than you honor God. Well, we had, we, we had, we had relatives come in, and, and we just didn't want to leave them. We thought that'd be rude. Who, who are you concerned about being rude with? Who, who, who are you concerned about insulting? Aunt, Aunt Joe and Uncle Harry, you, are, are you concerned about insulting them? Or are you, concern, are you concerned about the one who gave his life for you? Are you concerned about the one who died for you, who loved you? Listen, David said, listen, if you're looking for an excuse to stay out of God on Sunday, you, you're weary of your worship. David said it like this. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. I don't understand folks that are always looking for an excuse to stay out of church. I'm happy when I get here. Amen. Cindy might have to drag me out of bed Monday through Saturday, but on Sunday I get up all by myself. Amen. Why? Because you're the pastor. I know I'm the pastor, but I still like coming to, the, to God's house. We're weary. A whole lot of the world has become weary. They're, they're weary. Oh, oh, we love God. We watch him on live stream. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Cut the television off. Cut the stupid computer off and come get in your car and get some clothes on, some nicer clothes, amen, and come to God's house and sit down and worship the Lord. Uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. I know you can be sick. I, I know there's situations where you can't. But if you're looking for an excuse not to come to God's house, something's wrong with your worship. You've gotten weary of your worship. This ought to be the, Sunday ought to be the highlight of your week. Wednesday night ought to be the highlight of your work week. Come into God's house. Huh. Listen. Huh. You, you, can, you can defile the Lord through, through your sacrifice. You can also, God's name can be defiled by our service, verses 12 and 13. But you profane it in, in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and, the, and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. Profanity. There's different kinds of profanity. There's, there's profanity in the pool room and there's profanity that goes on in the house of God. If you come in here on Sunday morning and when people are praying, you're texting. Are you listening to me? People are leading in prayer and you're on your phone texting. You've just cursed God. You've just said prayer is unimportant. This Whoever I'm talking to is more important than talking to God. If you're looking for, if you're, if you're trying in your mind while the preacher's preaching and you're not hearing anything he's saying because you're, you're organizing a, a business meeting on Monday morning and, and you're trying to figure out your, your vacation, you're profaning the name of the Lord. You've come into his house to worship him. You want to wander out in the hallway. It's profanity in the name of the Lord. Come on, I feel it, amen. It's profanity. Get up, get up in the altar service and leave. Now, now uh, there could be an occasion where you'd have to. Maybe, maybe you just it felt bad the whole service and, and man, you're really sick and you need to, you need to leave or, or, or maybe you've already stayed because the preacher preached too long. You're already 30 minutes past when you're supposed to be at grandma's house for her birthday party. I, I understand. There, there's times when you got to leave, but just to get up because you can be the first one out and you can get to McDonald's a little bit either. That's profanity. That's profaning the name of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Listen, verse 10. Uh, this is the message Bible. Listen to this. Here's what God thinks about all of that. Don't, don't look in your Bible. Listen to me because you probably don't have the message Bible. But listen, listen to it because I want you to hear it just the way it says it. Why, why doesn't one of you just shut the temple doors and lock them? Then none of you can get in and play at religion with this silly, empty-headed worship. I am not pleased 
The God of the angel armies is not pleased, and I don't want any more of this so-called worship. God said, if that's what you're going to give me, why don't, why don't one of you just get up and nail the door shut? Just put a lock on it. If that's what, you, if that's what you've come to do, I, I'm not interested in it. I don't care for it. I don't want it. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your songs. I don't want it. If you don't love me, if you don't want to worship me, just lo somebody just lock the door. Just go on home. Because this it makes me sick. Listen, America would be far better off with fewer churches that are filled with more people that want to worship God than to have a multitude, multitude of churches that gather and just go through a routine motion that don't love God, that don't worship God, that, that, that their minds are on everything else but serving the Lord. God's name, thirdly, he says, needs to be declared. Look at verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name. Jesus, or Malachi here, is skipping past the dispensation that you and I are living in. He's going all the way to the end when the Lord comes back. When the Lord sits king over all the earth and his name will be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. There is coming a day, amen, when the whole earth will be filled with his glory. When every nation will praise him. When, when they will bring up their offerings and their sacrifices year by year and they'll offer them unto the king in Jerusalem. His name shall be praised. His name shall be glorified. Why? Because his name is great. We are a people of his name. We're Christians. We're called by his name. We're saved by his name. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We worship in his name. Jesus said, For where two or three of you are gathered together, there am I in the midst of you. There's authority in his name. The Bible says, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Prayer is answered in his name. If you will ask anything in my name, he said, I will do it. So that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, his name should be praised. It should be praised in our homes. It should be praised on our work sites. It should be praised in the house of God when we come together. We're not here to hear how beautifully they can put together an arrangement, how great the musicians are, or how, how, how organized the voices of the singers are. We've come. That the only reason for that group is to lead you into the presence of God. Where somewhere along the line, you forget about who's singing. You forget about who's playing. You forget about who's on the podium. You got your eyes closed and your hands lifted up and you're saying, God, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. You're wonderful. I glorify you. Hallelujah. That's worship. Are you weary of it? Do you go through the, clap your hands at the end of the song? Do you? Your mind's a thousand miles away? Huh. God said, I, I, I don't want that. There's power in his name. In his name. In his name, everything that you need, everything that you could want, everything is available in his name. Hallelujah. That's why, that's why the best songs that we sing are when we start singing something that says Jesus over and over again that has Jesus in it. Why? Because Jesus thrills the heart of a true worshiper. When I hear his name, listen, if something doesn't flip in you when, when you hear the name of Jesus, there's something wrong with your worship. We sing a song, Jesus, 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 hallelujah. There was a man went to went to the f county fair, took his whole family, had a, had a bunch of kids. When they went, they stayed all day. It wasn't just an hour or two. He, he planned the whole day and had a, had a kid. And, and if you, I don't know, I haven't been to the fair in so many years, but you used to have to buy tickets to the ride. Do you still buy tickets to the ride? I don't, I don't know. 
But you used to, you could, you could go to the window and you could get a ticket or four tickets for the, the octopus and three tickets for the Ferris wheel, amen, and, 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 and the ones that you threw up on, amen, they were about six tickets, amen. Who knows what I'm talking about? Well, this man, this man was going to be there all day with his kids. So you know what? And I remember this. He bought the whole row. You remember you used to buy a whole row, like 50 bucks, 100 bucks. You could buy a row of tickets. And so he just, he just meandered through the park and all the kids scattered and went with their friends. And, and he said he'd just stand there and they'd run by with their hands raised. And when, he, when they'd raise their hand, he'd pull off a ticket and give it to them. And they, off they went again. Well, here comes Johnny, and here comes Mary, and here comes Susie, and here comes some little rug rat he had never seen before. Amen. And he went, he, he, went to, he went to hand the kid a ticket, and he saw what it is, so he pulled the ticket back. And his son ran up and said, Daddy, this is Frankie. He's my new friend. And I told Frankie, you are my daddy, and if he'd just come and ask for a ticket, you'd give him one. He reached down and gave a little boy a ticket. Jesus said, Daddy, Raymond's my boy. Huh. And if he comes by and wants a ticket, if he, if he just asks for it in my name, you, you give him what he wants. Isn't that what Jesus said? If you ask anything in my name, I'll, I'll give it to you. How can you not worship that? How can y'all be in love with that? How, how, how can you come into this place with this people and sit there rock hard thinking about hunting or fishing or shopping or, or, or eating or anything else? How can you not keep your eyes and your, eye and your minds and your thoughts upon the king of glory with expectancy waiting for him to touch and change a life, waiting for him to work a miracle, waiting for him to heal the sick or deliver the oppressed? I come in this service every Sunday and every Wednesday with expectations. I give altar calls on Wednesday nights. Why? Because I just believe that God's always up to something. I believe he's a great God. He's my daddy, amen. And I worship him and I love him and I want to praise him. Here's the third thing and I'm done. Come on up, Cindy. Realize the nobility of God. Look at verse number 14. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord that which is blemished. Listen, for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Three things that we found out about, about God. He's a father huh, and we're his sons. He's a master, and we're his servants. And he's a king, and we're his subjects. So that every time we come to worship, if he's our father, we ought to honor him. If he's our master, we ought to serve him. And if he's our king, we ought to bow down before him and acknowledge that he is all that he says he is. He's a great God. Have you ever noticed, or, or did you notice when, when I was going through it, did, did you notice that's kind of how the Lord's Prayer begins? Our Father, which art in heaven. And it ends how? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Understand, listen, understand that when you come to this church, when you go into any place where God's people gather, that you've come, you ought to come with one assignment, and that's to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There was a, uh, this was a, a real story. A pastor told this. Had a large church, a very influential church in a, a large city in America, and uh, he heard rumblings that the, the president wanted to come to his church and visit wanted to come, it was election season and the president wanted to come and, uh, and just make an appearance at his church. And so the word got out throughout the community that the president was coming to this church. And can I tell you, the pastor said his phone blew up. 
Everybody that hadn't been there in the last 20 years wanted to know, is it true the president's coming? Is it true the president? Can you save me a seat? When's he going to be there? What's the service? And he had one lady. He hadn't seen her in, in a long, long time. And she called, is, is, it, is the president coming? What service is he going to be at? I want to be there. He had, he had about had all he could stand. He said, I, I don't know. He said, I don't know if the president's coming, but I promise you, if you come here this Sunday, the King of Kings will be here. Amen. The Lord of Lords will be in the place. I, I don't know if the president's coming. And can I tell you, can I tell you, Teddy, if, if the president were to come to Monroe, Georgia and come to Lighthouse, you couldn't pack the people in. They'd be standing outside. The king is here. Jesus is in this place. Won't you just stand up tonight and just lift up your hands and listen, if you've gotten a little bit weary in worship, say, Lord, I, I understand tonight, God, I don't want to be that man. I don't want to be that woman, God. I want to come into this place excited. I want to come into this place ready, God. I want to, I want to come in, Lord, on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, God, ready to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor because, God, you've been too good for me to shut up, God. You've been too good to me, Lord, to bring in, Lord, a, a half-hearted sacrifice. God, I give you everything. God, I love you. Father, we welcome you tonight. We worship you, Lord. I sent your presence in this place, God. I thank you for your word. Oh, God, be, help us to be mindful, Lord, to be true worshipers. For, God, that's what you seek for, Lord. That's what you're looking for, true worshipers, those who worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh, God, might we be that place. My lighthouse be a place, God, a tabernacle of your presence where your glory can come in and come down, touch and change lives, Lord. Oh, God, help us never to be weary of worship. Lord, help us to worship you well. God, give us, Lord, a heart of worship to praise and glorify your name. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, real quickly, you will be dismissed, but you're here tonight and you're not right with God. You're here tonight and you're not a Christian. You're here tonight and you're backslidden. You're not weary of worship. You just, you just, you just don't know how to worship. You've never, you've never known real worship. I tell you, when you know the King, you'll know how to worship. Amen. You'll know how to praise Him. When you know Him, you'll know how to give Him glory and honor. You say, Pastor, I need Jesus tonight. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Pray for me. If that's you, just raise your hand wherever you are tonight. You need Jesus. You need the Lord. You're not right with God. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. God, we give you praise. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, for this time together, Lord. Receive all honor, all glory, and all praise in Jesus' name. Let's sing this little chorus one time, and we'll be dismissed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.